there's almost this taboo of discussing waste and since I was a kid I was imagining where would it go where does it go and the answer is always to the landfill to the landfill but no they don't just go away there is no away where are these things going trash it's a necessary byproduct of our existence I pretty much consider a landfill this like chaotic, sort of just dump, unorganized, smelly, apocalyptic. <laughs> you know, you're walking on piles and mountains and you recognize the things across the field. But there's a lot of environmental activism there that I think was shocking for everybody. I think one of the biggest myths is that landfills are just big holes in the ground that materials get dumped into. That might have been true ages ago, but a modern landfill is really an engineering marvel. Three generations grew up on this property, uh, working here, living here. My grandfather grew up digging the lakes, and then my father worked on the farms that were located here, and then subsequently we came in and started working on the landfill for on the same piece of property. So we're working on our fourth landfill since I've been here. Through technology and reuse or recycle, I'd be happy not to build any more of these. Landfills as Museum is a way for us to start meditating on the end of life of products. Good afternoon, sir. Is this today's store? It is today's store. So, how are you doing? We still have people that feel that these operations are, are leftovers from the 50s, where there's no technology, there's no environmental controls in place, but people come out for a tour, they're just overwhelmed and wowed by the advances that we've made in managing the waste over the years. And a lot of folks sort of probably um, perceive us as being sort of the bad guy, that we're just in this for profit, but, but we're not. Students that are enrolling in design programs in fashion, before they start imagining new products, they have to be able to imagine life cycle assessments from a point of view that is a lived experience. So someone ate some fries, there's grease and there's ketchup, and so this will never get recycled. They thought of environmentalism at the front end and don't buy this, but I don't think they realized how much environmentalism comes at the end of life through organizations like waste management and how much of a feat of engineering it is. We are one of the largest recyclers in the country, if not the largest recycler in the country. I left with the sort of amazement of how productive they actually are. The car goes to be recycled. This is all the interior foam products and, and plastics and stuff that's not recyclable. We actually bring it back to the landfill. This is a good material for the trucks to be able to drive through because it can absorb the rainwater and the trucks can still get through it and drive through it. I didn't even know that they produced you know, energy that went back into the grid. That was so cool. I just expected to see a bunch mm. of steamy, like wet, you know, garbage. And I was so pleasantly surprised to see how beautiful, honestly, it was and like how well it's maintained. There are things that we do really well, but there are some parts that we need help on, and so this is a perfect time to be working with fashion designers, textile designers, to rethink about how garments are being designed so that by the time they get to us, we know that there are some other options for them that can extend the life and reduce the environmental impact of that garment. So if we could do something up front in the design, that's going to make it easier for a company like ours to reuse that product and get it back into market. I think it's important for corporations to understand where the products end up us big companies we have the power and responsibility to change things waste management mentioned there were 600 trucks that dumped a load just in that one day it sort of I don't know, reaffirms that trying to design things to stay out of the landfill is sort of the most important thing these students are the future they're the ones who care they're the ones who are mad about the state of the world they were born into i feel that we had a number of students that were volunteering their own time to be there to learn about circular systems so that they can create and that connection is really what we need. It's up to the younger generation who's coming up with these uh, new technologies that maybe can help. You know, fashion is very attractive, it's glamorous, everyone wants to design a beautiful collection, but it's an actual product. Consider the lifespan especially and where you want your garment to be in 50 years. As a designer, I commit to mindful design and mindful appropriation of material. Each person plays a role in making it successful. I think there's this thought that, well, just put it in the can, sort of out of sight, out of mind, instead of realizing that every purchasing decision that you make has an impact. 
And I feel like it just made me like think beyond the fashion industry. Being involved in something like this is so important because it just teaches you like how to build a better relationship with waste. We need to observe waste as a new resource and we have to think of waste as an asset. This has to stop becoming a polarized issue and a political issue and start to become a human issue. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia Lee. I'm a journalist, and I was the one who directed this short documentary about landfills. Um, just quick shout out. We have our stars of our short documentary over here. Hi, Bobby. Hi, guys. And Theanne. I'm going to quickly introduce our amazing panelists. We have Celine Simon. We have Jay, who's the environmental manager for waste management. And then Aisha Martin, she's the director of global purpose at Adidas. So thank you everyone for being here and everyone for watching that short documentary about waste. Let's build a better relationship with waste. So can we all introduce ourselves really fast, and then talk about your first memory with trash. Because I know we come from all over the world, and to be at a landfill that was that beautiful and organized is a privilege. Actually, that was like going to Disneyland for us. It was so much fun. <laughs> Jay, should we start with you? Sure. Thanks for having us here. As waste management, we're extremely honored to be part of this and be partnered with Slow Factory. So I am Jay Kaplan. I'm the environmental manager for waste management and I'm based here in Brooklyn. And when you think of my title, you're probably wondering, what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, I don't either. But <laughs> I do a lot of things. I'm an environmentalist. I'm an engineer. I do permitting. Uh, I'm a mentor. I'm a mentoree. I'm a student and teacher and, and all these different things at waste management. And when you're in the waste industry, you have to be able to transform and, and be resilient. So that's what we do. <laughs> Aisha. Hi. Hi, everyone. So um, my name's Aisha. I'm actually originally from South Africa. So it definitely was a privilege seeing waste managed in this way. Um, I work for Adidas in the Global Purpose team, and really everything that we do is anchored in creating movements and the actions on the ground. So as opposed to just making bold statements, our team are really focused on social impact initiatives and creating change that we want to see. And I'm Céline Seman. I don't think I need an introduction now. <laughs> but I'm so honored to be sitting between Adidas and Waste Management, my two partners, on this crazy adventure. When I first pitched it to Jay, I was like, I'm going to turn the landfills as museums. And he's like, no, no, it can't be, because it's not a museum. And, I'm <laughs> and then over and over, we, we try to explore the idea of the important idea of bringing uh, students, or at least design students, to live the experience of being in a landfill. And I come from Lebanon, as you heard before. And like Aisha, I, for me, the landfills in America, they're also like Disneyland, because uh, in Lebanon, it's not as organized. We don't have the same technology. We don't even have the same resources, actually. Waste, for me, is a very personal issue, because uh, I don't know if you follow the news, but not too long ago, two years ago, there was a waste crisis in, in my country where there was waste literally everywhere, like on the streets, everywhere. We had nowhere to put it. We had run out of landfills. Landfills were not organized or designed the same way waste management organizes. And basically, there's an anatomy of the landfill, really, that we learn together, right? That you guys structure it in a way where it can col like slowly collapse, release energy, and re recycle that energy. And so landfill as museums is a big uh, learning experience and diving deep into what circularity means from the end of life perspective. Thank you. Aisha, did you want to elaborate more on your first memory with trash while growing up in South Africa? Yeah, I mean, when I think about it, I actually giggle a little bit, which maybe isn't 
I don't know, maybe that seems weird, but for me, growing up, we were actually taught to value everything. And so waste became, or perce perceived waste became a resource for us. So for me, when I hear that question, I think about maybe coming home from school and thinking, yes, I saw an ice cream tub in the freezer, I'm gonna have a nice scoop, and then opening it, and it's my mom that's reused the container <laughs> to have something else, so for me, we were taught from a young age that waste is not necessarily like products, things shouldn't just be discarded. We had to be resourceful because we had to make the most of what we have. So that really makes me think of my mom. Mm. So, yeah. Jay, any first memories with trash? Well, I, I uh, encourage everyone to think about their first memory with trash too. It's quite an interesting narrative. It is, and, and that, that story actually reminded me of something. I had something else I was going to say, but I've changed my mind. Because <laughs> uh, when I was 12 and 13 years old, in my neighborhood, they had bulk collection every summer. And I would go out on my bicycle at, to, through bulk collection, and I would bring home all sorts of things, old lawnmowers and tractors, and I'd fix them up, and I'd put them in the front yard, and I'd sell them. And my mother always used to say, well, you know, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? I'm like, it's going, it's going, it's going to be sold. And everything's sold, and eventually that's how I bought, bought my first car. Just <laughs> getting junk and selling. Yeah. I want to ask the audience really fast. Raise your hand if you know where your trash specifically goes. Which landfill? Raise your hand high, and waste management does not count. <laughs> waste management, you can't raise your hand. <laughs> Over there, can you, where does your trash go? Yeah. Um, I believe it goes to overseas. Yeah. 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 No, okay, so one person in this entire audience. Oh, right. oh. sorry, one, here. Uh, Richmond Point Landfill versus California. Oh. California. Right, right in Richmond, California, next, next door. Where do you live? <coughs> in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Oh, Berkeley, I was like, wow, your trash from Brooklyn goes to California? <laughs> Got it, Berkeley, <laughs> cool. Um, so this film talked about it a lot, how <laughs> when we throw something away, we have the separation with waste. When we throw it away, it just goes away, right? and then we don't think about it anymore. And I think landfills as museums brings it full circle. So I wanted to ask you three, is trash a necessary byproduct of life? I guess I'll take that first. <laughs> uh, well, there's always going to be some residual material generated from uh, whatever you were doing. And just, you know, as a consumer, packaging, as if you think about it today, there's so many different types of packaging and it's hard to even decide what to do with half the things that we have. And, and I know we're going to talk about recycling later. I don't want to go jumping too far ahead. But when it comes to uh, landfills and residuals, um, there, there will be a need for it, I think, indefinitely. I think what we need to do and what, the, what we're doing here today is really talking about how to design things so that we're using less, reusing what we can, and then whatever can't be reused or or um, used by someone else, let's just say, is finally recycled. Is trash a necessary byproduct of life? Of life? Of life. Of well, life. Um, <laughs> so I guess we can go on a deeper um, philosophical understanding that you know every time you breathe out, you create something that could be considered trash. Carbon dioxide. Yes, but that nature uses as food, right, for the plants and so on. And so when we look at it this way, is it really trash what we're doing? Or can we start looking at it as a resource, more, more importantly? And so I, I would address any designer to really think the way that we design things, the way that we even consume things, the way that we live our lives, does it really have to go in a linear format? Or could we start thinking of micro circles that we start creating, for instance, like washing the tub of ice cream and using it as a Tupperware rather than tossing it in the recycling and buying Tupperware, for example. And 
for instance, the way that we approach trash in Slow Factory is not so much as trash, but can it be a resource? Can we uh, start closing that loop, you know, on little things that we do every day as consumers? Of course, larger things that we can influence within the industry. And I, I really don't believe in trash. I don't think trash exists. It's just a system that is designed in a linear way. It, the end product is not trash. Yeah, I, I also agree, and thank you for your comments, but I think it's also about reframing waste specifically and finding value in the end of life of products and how do we work to extend the life of products through reuse or recycling. Um, I also think that it's really important to use it as an opportunity to get creative. Like the, the powerful nature of this collaboration here was just because we used our platforms to inspire and enable people to take action around what is a really wicked problem because we can't solve it individually and we have to be open to collaboration. So I think, yeah, waste maybe shouldn't be deemed as something detrimental because reframing it makes us all feel more inclined to think about possibilities. Um, and together, we can try and work things out. Together. So that actually leads to my next question. Celine, how do we make a linear system that you mentioned into a circular system with all of us working together? <laughs> I always make the um, comparison that it's like taking a tube and trying to bend it in a circle. And it's like, Ugh! especially if you have zero muscles like me. And uh, <laughs> But it is a, a collective effort. For instance, like this little collaboration, we just went once. I mean, we went more than once, but with the students. We, as I went two times, um, <laughs> but with the students, we're, we, we are having a, an entire program for the next months to come, eight to 12 months even, and with my colleague, um, Dr. Thian Shiros, who I don't know she was sitting here. Oh, here she is. Um, Dr. Thian Shiros is including it as part of her class at FIT with life cycle assessment. So this idea of bending the linear system, like this feels a little less, um, hard to do on your own because you have someone like Thian, you have someone like Jay, you have someone like Aisha, and it's a human chain, honestly. It's not like Adidas and waste management, these obscure entities. It's very much like individuals within every single organization. There's always a champion in an organization that's going to listen to you, that's going to open up the door for you and allow something to change. It could be a small project, hopefully it leads to a second, and we create like a, a as Ayana was saying this morning, a wave or a ripple that goes into a wave, and um, it's it's a chain of people holding each other. So let's start that ripple effect. Mm -hmm. Jay, you mentioned wish cycling before, and I wanted to a lot wanted you to elaborate on it. One, what is wish cycling, and how do we combat that as consumers? So wish cycling is is really simple, and I think everyone in this room may be guilty of it at one point or another. It's when your expectation of recycling a material or, or something you have at home exceeds the ability of the recycling facility where that material is gonna ultimately go. So for example, uh, you have a pizza box that gets stained with oil and cheese and whatever, and you put it in your recycling bin and you say that's gonna go and it's gonna become another pizza box. Well, it's not. What's gonna happen is it's gonna go on a conveyor belt and someone's gonna see it's contaminated and they're gonna take it off, it's gonna go into the trash and then it, it will never get recycled. So that's like one example. Um, I could give you many, but like for example, you have a toaster that breaks, metal, and you think, well, I'll, I'm gonna recycle it, right? It's metal, put it in. Well, it's not, it doesn't fit that traditional form of recycling and really the, the issue is on the education side when people are trying to determine what should go where, whether it's a recycling item or garbage item, they, they don't really think about it in those terms. They just say it's metal, maybe there's some plastic, an extension cord has metal in it, right? And they throw it into the recycling bin, and then it goes to a recycling plant and it gets wrapped around the conveyor belts and it takes an employee three hours to take it out and, and this, the system's down for hours, right? So that's sort of like, of painting the picture of, of why all this contamination is really challenging and, and what wish cycling is really doing to the system. It's really slowing it down and making it really hard to recycle. 
and through education and understanding, we can make it better. Um, ultimately, however, I think what we really need to do is really take a look at what are we buying as consumers? What makes sense? Is, is the item that we're going to buy, do we really understand what the life cycle of it is? Is it going to be something that will have a long life or is it a single use? You're going to throw it away or you're going to try to recycle it. Can it even be recycled? So, you know, we really need to ask ourselves these questions and think as consumers of how do we really want to invest our dollars because those dollars can drive the industry to make adjustments and make improvements so that there's less wish cycling. Mm. So wish cycling starts with really good intention, but then your greasy pizza box might have shut down the recycling facility center for hours and stopped the entire system. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So wish cycling has large consequences. Negative consequences. What are some other, just really fast, name them off the top of your head, products that people usually wish cycle that can't be recycled? Uh, any sort of, uh, let's say like a paper that has like a foil attached to it or a plastic that has, you know, like multi-type, multi-layer material. So coffee cups with plastic yes. layering inside. Yep. Okay. That's a great one. Um, any, any sort of appliance, toys. Um, what about in the plastic realm? In the plastic realm, so like the peel-off sticker type of thing on like a yogurt container is not recyclable. Berry containers? They like, can be. They can be? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Most cartons are not recyclable. Anything that's got food in it, I think the number one thing I would want everyone to think about is when you have a food container and you want to recycle it, you have to clean it. Yeah, your hummus container, your peanut butter container, which takes so long to clean, by the way. You will spend 20 minutes cleaning that peanut butter container, but it's worth it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just a quick raise your hands. Who has wish cycled in the past? Ooh. Um, that's Even the waste management Even waste fault. management team. Hey. Wow. I wish cycle, okay? You wish, I wish cycle. cycle. I do, I can't help it. It's like it. a confessional of the wish cyclers. <laughs> Um, Aisha, why is it so important for a brand like Adidas or any brand to understand the life cycle assessment of a product and to understand where their products could end up? I think, again, it's just thinking about things at the start of the journey and sort of reassessing the paths that we would take. So thinking about sustainability up front, and that's really something that we adopt. And it's not just something that we talk about, it's the culture of the brand internally as well. It's not just about how we innovate and create technologies and products that stand up to the performance standards that is expected from our brand, because we have athletes who are superpowers and or have superpowers, and we support them with our product, and we need to uphold that. So it's really taking the approach from the from the outset, and thinking about sustainable product is not sort of a diffusion line, but how do we? Introduce it into and across all categories, um, and I think that really talks about how we behave internally, but then externally, it's how do we use our platform and understand and acknowledge that yes, we are part of the problem, so how do we build the solutions and how do we inspire and enable the next generation, everybody here, people to take small or big actions, take them with us on the journey. There's actually an article in the zine, which is a reflection from the designers on Futurecraft Loop, which was scaled to today and is still scaling. It's a beta test at the moment and it's ultimately a shoe that's made to be remade. But the beauty is that that started 10 like years and years ago, but we're only now able to bring it to and story, story tell it around it, test it. Um, and then I just also wanna say like part of the power and truly I believe this as a person, as a human, I am a human being that works for a big brand. So my beliefs, my values, they come with me to work and unlocking purpose. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> unlocking purpose in my everyday is my job and I'm grateful for that, but it's fostering relationships with our partners, with creators, with people like Celine, talking to the students, to the next generation. And like there's a group of students from our seed program in the audience. There's just so much to do. And I think we also have to be open to learn by doing. And I'm just really grateful that we have that opportunity and to be here today. Thank you.
Celine, what was the most surprising sustainability engineering feat that you discovered at the landfills? But it wasn't so much of a discovery rather than it was like a thesis we had that we have to push for design for this assembly. It has to be a norm. And waste-led design, the whole process of it, the entire um, uh, sort of education curriculum around waste-led design was to be reinforcing uh, design for this assembly, understanding not just recycling, reuse, repurpose, like the normal R's that we're all accustomed to, but how do we design for that toaster to be taken apart so easily? How do we design for the phone that when you are discarding it, the system is ready to receive it, and so we can take it apart and reuse it and evaluate quickly which parts are still good to be reused, which parts are needing to be melt down, because when we think of recycling, we really um, imagine that it's all going towards this tunnel of shredder, the shredder, you know? You put it in there, it's going to get shredded, and then it's going to become something new magically. It's like a Dr. Seuss machine where on one end you put in your stuff, and on the other end comes like everything fun. And, um, <laughs> and, so, and the idea for me, I've always drew that, that machine, and we've tried to do it in several instances uh, with previous projects that I was doing just as an awareness you know, machine. When we went to the landfills, what we discovered is that unfortunately, like we are putting things out and no one or the system is not ready to receive them or if they are, they don't have the tools because what, how it's designed, it's designed in such an opaque way that it's not open, it's not ready to be dismantled, it's not designed for this assembly. So what we saw there was the, it was more even, um, it was reassuring us that this thesis needed to be pushed as an agenda uh, for the industry to start Im implementing immediately notions of design for this assembly. Thank you. Um, so one of the most surprising things I learned while oh. at the landfills was in that film, we circled the methane pipe. So methane is a natural emission from landfills, and methane is a gas that's 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So it's actually even worse for our ecosystem. But what waste management does is they use that pipe and they extract the methane and put it back into the power grid. So Jay, I wanted to talk about what does the circular surplus economy mean and how does waste management accomplish this? Sure, so um, great point on, and there's many of those wells that, that was circled on that video. If you did notice it, every landfill has uh, potentially up to hundreds of those extraction points where we're pulling methane gas out of the landfill mass and pipelining it to uh, engines that generate electricity. We also clean it and compress it and use it to power our collection vehicles that go out and pick up trash. Um, and, you know, we're, and we're continuously looking at new and different ways to use that gas. Uh, on the power generation side, that power that we make runs our facility, and as you mentioned, there's a surplus of energy, which we uh, then put back into the grid, and it runs and powers thousands of homes in the community in which we operate. So the electricity right now can be powered by waste management? Yes. Technically? Yep. That's amazing. Um, Aisha, how has the responsibility of brands evolved as sustainability has come into the forefront? And how does a brand that relies on business profit balance that with consumerism and sustainability? I think that's a really good question. Um, I do think that there's power in community. And so the community of consumers have been a lot more vocal about what they expect and demand from big brands. And I think from an Adidas perspective, we've taken on initiatives for many years, but not necessarily spoken about them. And so now is the time to really speak our truth internally and externally, and that's great. I also think that as a big brand, we have the responsibility to start inching towards different changes. So one of the big changes that we're gearing towards is coming off virgin polyester by 2024. Um, and I think that for the sports industry is a huge move in itself. It's about changing behaviors, but also the way that we essentially approach everything around creating product. Um, I do also think that what's really important is to, again, from a global purpose perspective, think about how that inspiring and enabling part is true and authentic. And so what we're really focused on as well is not just talking about things, but doing the things. Like, how do we actually get out there and 
go to a landfill and equip students? How do we do things like host one of the biggest events ever to get people running for the planet? Um, I also really love, and we've heard it a few times today, but truly our approach to sus sustainability is from a people and planet perspective. So we care for the planet, but we also care for people. And we've been doing lots of work in that realm too. Um, I also think a lot of the journey is gonna be about shifting norms and we need everyone's help to do that. So an example, and you can read about it as well, but with the made to be remade Futurecraft looped shoe, part of the test was seeding the product and then having consumers return that. And some consumers didn't return the product. So we do have work to do as a group, as a collective to change our behaviors and shift mindset um, because it essentially to be a circle, we all have to act together. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask each of you, as we're wrapping up, how do we build a better relationship with waste on an individual level? Jay, we can start with you. Okay, so I go back to what I mentioned before. I think the first thing we really need to take a hard look at as an individual is what am I really buying as a consumer? You know, do I really need it? And if I do need it, what is its life expectancy? How is this item going to look when I'm done with it? Can I reuse it? Can I let someone else reuse it? Or um, what, is the, what is the ultimate fate? And the second piece of that would be, if I can't reuse it, can't give it to someone else to reuse, is it recyclable at all? And I think that we need to, as a culture, just focus on it and, and make that change. Very quickly, um, I have two kids, so the relationship with waste is exponential because like they make so much waste. Even just a crafting session is like, ah, I feel so bad. I'm I'm not an environmentalist. My relationship to sustainability goes down to like below ten. You know, you're like, but they're having fun and they're creating. So waste is like a constant conversation to me, and I feel that we have to remove the stigma and the shame around it for sure because if we are um, overwhelmed with shame and stigma, there's going to be very little uh, creativity that we're gonna be able to, to do about it or very little problem solving. Um, and so I work on, on not having too much shame around it. Um, I too have a son. So um, for me, I think what's really important because I have to first acknowledge my privilege as well, and that the way that I live today is very different, and my son's life is very different to how my life was. So I think for me, what I really want to think about is how do I stay connected to my community, my culture, and how do I take the lessons that my mom and her mom taught her and ingrain them within my son? And that is about spirituality. Ooh. <laughs> but it's also about just being really conscious and mindful about behavior, the way that we use things, the way that we essentially treat ourselves and the products around us. Um, and I think by instilling that and sort of hopefully all the ancestral spirituality and seeds of goodness that we no longer should ignore and should embrace. I think that we could really shift things just by finding the human connection to things and ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> one of the things that Celine and I always talk about when we went to the landfills was how meditative it was. So I wanna close out this panel with a quick meditation on trash. Um, if we can all close our eyes and have your posture be a little straight. Your feet should be firmly planted on the ground so you feel connected to the earth. And then your palms should be either facing up or down. So take a deep breath in through your nose here and hold it here. And I want you to think about an item you're going to throw away today. And breathe out through your mouth. And take another deep breath in through your nose and think about all the hands that had to touch this item so you can be able to use it or wear it and now throw it away and how it's connected to you. You can breathe out your mouth now. And breathe in through your nose again. And think about how you will no longer wish cycle. <laughs> and you'll understand that waste is not separate of us. It's a part of us and it's part of humanity. And you could breathe out through your mouth. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.